Cashflow Diary Podcast, episode 409. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leverage streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I am your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you're here today because some of you, I know, you, you listen to us from many different places. And one of the challenges that you face is how can I get access to maybe investments and opportunities in places where I don't live? Well, what's really cool is that today's technology allows you and I to do those types of things, and you just need to know the correct marketplaces to, to search out, to find, and, and, and to go make these things happen. Well, wait no longer. I have with me today an entrepreneur who has managed to build an organization around that very concept, literally giving you and I uh, the opportunity, the 99% to invest like the 1% so that you can live where you lo- want to live, live where you love, but invest where the dollars make sense. Because at the end of the day, where you live may not make any sense to invest, or you just want exposure to completely different markets. And I think we're going to learn a lot about that today. I have with me today none other than Scott Picken. Now, he has a wonderful accent because he's from South Africa, and you'll hear it completely in all of the words that he says. so get ready for that. But he's the co-founder uh, and CEO of Wealth Migrate, a fintech company that offers real estate investments on its online marketplace through crowdfunding. Now, some interesting things that you may already know, so he's got a book out there, Property Gone Global. They've been featured as the KPMG Global Top 50. But what I think is really interesting he likes ultra marathons. That sounds very, very interesting to me. He's been on Kilimanjaro. In fact, he's even been on Necker Island. Now, all of these things together means he's got a lot of wealth of experience to share with you and I that will help you and I continue to become bigger, better, better investors, business owners, and CEOs ourselves. So make sure that you are ready to listen, to hear, to take notes, and then probably to duplicate Mr. Scott Pickin. Scott, are you there? Jay, wonderful to be online. Hope that we can share lots of value. And thanks for that uh, kind introduction. Lots to live up to. <laughs> well, that, that's all your past. You've already lived up to that. Yeah, no, I've been very privileged. If I was to uh, keel over today, I've had a wonderful, uh, wonderful existence and uh, try to live every single day as if it's the last day. So I've been very, very grateful for, for the journey so far. Indeed, indeed, indeed. So this being your first time here, I need to ask you the same question that I tend to ask everybody the first time that they're here. Are you ready? I am. All right. So I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. You know, Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman, Superman, etc. And I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common. Chief among them is the fact that, well... Occasionally, as an entrepreneur, we can envision ourselves as flying around town and saving customers with our products and services and providing a better lifestyle. But also, like a superhero, an entrepreneur has a beginning. For example, Spider-Man. There was a time where he was just a kid going to school, trying to earn good grades, taking some photos to make some extra money, maybe get, you know, order some pizza, etc. And then one day he gets bit by a spider. Suddenly he discovers that, hey, I've got this special ability to go out there and, and, and do things. And I've got to choose whether I'm going to use it for good or evil. So my question to you, sir, is before Wealth Migrate, before all of the influential people that you have met and, and been exposed to, before all the, the awards you know, from PKF Capital and the FinTech Awards and all the other things that you have done, before all that, what we want to know is, who is Scott Picken? 
<laughs> That's a great story. I've never, never, never had an intro like that. So, look, I think from my side, Jay, who is Scott Piggin? I am um, someone who's deeply passionate about love, uh, about life in general. I love to, you know, really live everything to the full. I started out as a young boy, and you know, I was the, I was the boy while everyone else was fishing, where I was sitting in the river trying to build a dam. And um, my point being is that I've always loved building things, and mm. I never saw the point of fishing. Quite frankly, for me, it's boring. <laughs> but uh, but I love building things, and I've kind of spent the rest of my life actually building businesses and and uh, and and you know investment portfolios, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I've really enjoyed that. The other side of me that I think is really important is that at a young age, I you know I found a, a real passion for jumping on stage and actually presenting. And uh, literally from the age of about 10, I um, have been doing, you know, public speaking and debating, et cetera. Mm. But really where that fits into was educating mm -hmm. and uh, teaching people and ultimately empowering people. And I really believe that, you know, that's you talk about the superpower and uh, Spider-Man getting bitten by the spider. I suppose for me, my spider bite was somewhere, somewhere in the environment when I realized that you can really change people's lives by sharing knowledge with them and, and by teaching them. And, um, you know, I suppose that's when, for me, I, I started to grow and, and, and to teach and to learn and, and ultimately, you know, from life's experiences, share with others. So I don't know how much detail you want me to go into, but um, the last thing I will say is that I did my, uh, my first programming course when I was six years old hmm. and my first real estate project when I was 13 years old. And I've spent my entire life trying to marry together the technology and real estate industry. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. I can promise you at six, I was not programming. I waited till seven for that. Uh, but I, I totally hear you there. Totally hear you there. And I do agree with you. Fishing is boring. Uh, but that's a whole nother. Just the idea of it. I still don't understand some of the people who like, yeah, I can't wait to go fishing. I'm like, but why? You know, but I, I hear you. I hear you. Now, I have a couple of questions, though, because you said something that I think is really, really important. You said you, you have a love for building things, but the things that you build aren't necessarily tangible, meaning, uh, you know, Legos and it, they're tangible buildings. They're physically tangible. But the things you like to build aren't necessarily tangible. They're they're concepts and ideas and constructs and 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 businesses that a kate that go out there and transform lives etc uh, is there a difference in your world from building something physical because there's i know there's a number of entrepreneurs listening who who like the idea of you know ooh, bricks and mortar and, and and doing that but you're talking about a different kind of building yeah i think it's a great question i Started out young, like I said, I, I, I renovated my first property when I was 13 years old, in, you know, project where my, uh, my brother and I were sharing a room and I persuaded my, my parents that I no longer wanted to share so that um, I actually extended the house and put a, no. uh, a, be a be double bedroom bathroom onto, onto the house. No, I mean, I was, uh, you're kidding. Oh, don't get me wrong. Don't, don't get me wrong. I guarantee you that there was an architect and uh you know, Kwani Surveyor and a whole bunch of other professionals involved. But that was the beauty of my parents, that they gave me the self-belief that I was in charge, you know. So, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, no, that's, that's, so that's where it started. So I've always had a love for, for real estate and, and things that are tangible. And, um, but on the other side of the equation, you know, building businesses is something that, that really is amazing. And I spend a lot of time learning from some of the wealthiest in the world. And, you know, I love, I love comments from people like Tony Robbins that, we say, if you want to get wealthy, do what wealthy people do. If you want to be successful, do what successful people do. And I suppose what I really learned is that people tend to make a lot of money in business and then, you know, park it in real estate. So they, they basically preserve it. Uh, it's called wealth preservation, as, as we call it, where it, it continues to earn a good cash flow return and it's very stable and secure. And then they can make more money in, in the business world. And the reason being is that really the amount of money that you can make in the business world is directly proportional to the amount of value you can add. And you can add a lot value, a lot more value a lot quicker because, you know, real estate is often pegged to to time and, and bigger macroeconomic factors you can't take into account. So I do believe in life you need to balance things. Um, I personally, when it comes to the stock market and the bond market and stuff that that I can't control, 
you know, I tend to, I'm not really heavily invested in that. But, but honestly, from my perspective, I believe really that, 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 that one needs to really master, find what you enjoy and master it. And so my perspective on that, you know, whether it's tangible or intangible, the most important thing you need to do is find what you love and just get better and better and better. It's that whole rule of 10,000 hours. And, um, you, know, w- you know, then it doesn't actually matter whether it's tangible or intangible because you just you, you get to go on holiday every single day and get paid. <laughs> totally understood. And if, well, if you started at 13 with the renovation, by the way, I, I hope none of my kids hear what you just said because I can suddenly get there. I can hear them going, hey, I want a playground out back. Why don't you let me build it? I'm like, OK, uh, that that's a whole new conversation for, for parents right there. But if you've been doing this well, since 13, 10,000 yeah, hours, you passed a long time ago. I'm sorry, what? And, and Jay, I would challenge you. Why, why don't you let them build it? Why don't I? Yeah, I, it, there's, it's a double edged sword because on one end, it's like, oh, my gosh, uh, you know, what kind of what 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 am I creating with that? But at the on the other end of that, it's like, wow, the the fact that that was your solution that, you know, most people, you know, most people go, I, I want another bedroom. Let's move. You're like, no, no, here's fine. We can just build one. <laughs> I, I think that's amazing. What's one, that? of the greatest, uh, one of the greatest skill sets, I believe, as an entrepreneur is to, we all have problems. One of the greatest skill sets as an entrepreneur is to find solutions to problems. And often, I heard a great saying just a couple of other d- days ago that uh, often within constraints lie your greatest solutions. So I, I believe don't run away from problems, run straight at them. Indeed. I like that. Um, so d- explain for us a, a little bit. How do we go from... 13 year old who's doing a renovation project to wealth migrate. There's got to be a path there. I'm assuming you didn't wake up one day and just go, Ooh, I have this idea. Wealth migrate. Uh, what was the journey that, that ultimately has resulted in, in what we know today? So I'll, I'll try and keep it short and, and condense kind of 30 years of my life. But in simple terms, like I said, I always enjoyed building. So I went to university, I studied a BSc construction management. Uh, from 95 to 1998 in Cape Town, South Africa. I did my dissertation on how technology was going to change the property and construction industry, mm. which, you know, when, when you read the thesis today, it makes common sense. In those days, the industry couldn't spell the word IT. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so a little bit ahead of my time. And then uh, I went to London. I worked for an Irish. I went to London when I was 21 years old. Uh, I worked for an Irish property developer over there. Um, at the same time, so on top of a full-time job, I did a full-time master's in construction IT. There were only two universities in the whole of England that actually offered it. And I again did my dissertation on how technology was going to change the space. And really for me, at the age of uh, 25, I realized I'd be the world's worst employee in mm. the world. And I, um, I'd actually been doing projects in both London and in South Africa uh, literally since, you know, since, it's, well, for, for five or six years already. And a lot of my friends were coming to me and saying, well, how do you do this? How do you find these properties? How do you, how do you build them? How do you renovate them? We'd already done our, our first development. And I realized, you know, why am I working for someone else? Why don't I start my own company and help others do this? So I resigned and started a company, International Property Solutions, when I was 26. We basically help people invest in England, South Africa, Australia, and America, and over the years, we helped about 2,500 people invest in apartments and houses. And we always were trying to get it more and more efficient by using technology. But at the end of the day, we were still helping individuals buy one house. And what I noticed was there was a huge gap in the market with people that didn't have the money for a deposit and or they didn't think that they, they thought they were more sophisticated than residential and they wanted to get into commercial, but then they didn't have enough money and or they didn't have enough knowledge as to how to go into different markets. And then in 2008, we had the Lehman Brothers crash. Mm. And what was fascinating in London specifically is there was tremendous opportunity. I mean, you could buy buildings for 50p on the pound. And there was one in Wimbledon, which is where the tennis is, where there were 48 units. It was uh, cash flowing at between uh, 12 and 13% net, uh, fully furnished and tenanted. And I could literally pick them up at a, at a massive discount. But I only had one little problem. I had to get 10 million pounds together quickly because they don't sell one unit. You had to buy the whole building. Mm. And I ran onto all my clients and I just couldn't get people to come together. Like everyone was thinking like an individual. And yet the only way we could do it is if we had the buying power of an institution. And we lost that deal. 
And I said, never again. I'm going to create a platform to bring people together so that they've got the buying power of the institutions. And luckily for me, in 2009, I met my co-founder, Henny Besaidnote. He's 20 years my senior, a very, very wealthy man who's listed uh, two companies on two continents. And most importantly for me, he had tremendous experience in both the development space, uh, the real estate development space, and the real estate commercial investing space. And they were looking to set up an international real estate um, REIT. And I was like, well, look, that's, that's pretty traditional. Everyone else is doing pretty much the same thing. Why don't we build a platform where we can ultimately help people invest in the best commercial opportunities globally? And so we literally launched Wealth Migrate in 2010. It took us about three and a half years to figure out the compliance, because if you think the compliance is difficult in one country and mm. just dealing with C. You should try go across border in multiple countries. And um, yeah, we basically launched in October 2013. And I'm proud to say now we've got members from 97 countries and investors from 35 countries. So clearly we're tapping into a need that, uh, that exists out there for people to get access to the best you know, opportunities globally, but also be able to diversify between countries, currencies and asset classes. So what you're really saying is that Wealth Migrate was just an evolution of the, the same thing that you, you discovered back when you were 13. You're like, hey, I, I want a bigger room, so why don't I build it? You just saw a, so it became a solution to a problem. Yeah, look, Jay, you're not, you're not far wrong. You know, I, am, I, I really have a huge amount of admiration for Richard Branson. And, you know, if you read his books, he, he literally says most of the businesses he created were out of his own need. And he was like, well, if I've got a need, someone else must have a need. And um, it wasn't too dissimilar. You know, by the age of 30, I owned properties on four continents. And, you know, trying to deal, particularly with residential property, trying to deal with management agents and getting a bunch of emails and bank accounts and tax and structures, uh, you know, on four different continents was an absolute nightmare. I absolutely hate admin. So not only is the positive of everything I said about the, you know, having the buying power of the institutions, but on the other side of the equation, it really just makes my life so much easier. I can manage my, my global portfolio of my mobile phone. And, and so, you know, by solving my problem, we've literally solved the same problem that thousands of others have. And, and quite frankly, you know, hundreds of millions of people have. So, you know, that, that's really why, we, why we're excited about what, what's happening at the moment and what the opportunities are. Indeed, indeed. So when you, you, you do this, though, a platform such as yours ends up making the, the earth very, uh, what I like to call flat. You know, it's very easy to access things that were previously difficult. I mean, if you think about it, not, I mean, a while ago it was communication was hard until the telephone and now the internet. And now we expect instantaneous response, even if they're across the globe. I sent you a text message. Why didn't you respond? You know, and you're kind of doing that same thing from from a real estate perspective, which takes an immense amount of of knowledge and expertise, because it, it's not just about having the money. It's about knowing how it works in multiple countries. How on earth do you guys manage that? All right, everybody, thanks for listening. And I'm glad that you are enjoying what you are hearing thus far. But here's one of the things that's really important. One of the most important things that you can do is get started. One of the things that I've said before, and I say again, once you get started, stay started. But more importantly, there can be lots of roadblocks to getting started. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove one of those roadblocks for you and make it a little bit easier. Because the thing that I don't want to stop you is thinking, do I need a local number? How about a long distance number? Or should it be 800? How on earth am I going to make that happen so that people can contact me as I'm out there building my business, making my cash flow grow, but most importantly, understanding that it doesn't have to be difficult. Many of you may know, but if you don't there's a company out there by the name of Grasshopper. And what I want you to do is I want you to go over to trygrasshopper.com forward slash cash flow diary. Grasshopper is the entrepreneur's phone system. It works like a traditional phone system, but requires no hardware to purchase, no software to install. It's just the number that flat works. So if you are out there building that distributed workforce across many different locations, it's a way for you to still go out there and make your number be unified, simple, easy to use, something we've been using for quite some time. So again, go over to trygrasshopper.com forward slash cash flow diary. Now, let's get back to the rest of the story. So that's a great question. And I think I'll answer it with a story. 
It was 2009. The American property market had completely tanked, as you as you as you're aware. <laughs> yeah, I was here. And the, <laughs> yeah. well, well, what was interesting that most most Americans don't know is that they always, you know, and again, this is not an American problem; it's a global problem. People always think that where they live in the city they live or the country they live is the only opportunity, the only country to invest. Nope. What was interesting in right. 2009, the Australian property market or real estate market was the best performing real estate market in the G20 countries. And so I don't believe that every market is the right market at all times. Right. You need to have the right systems in place to be able to determine based on macroeconomic fundamentals where to be. Mm -hmm. And we were actually in Australia, so we got a system called GIDS, our Global Investment Due Diligence System, which you know I could I could talk to you for hours about if you're interested. But but in simple terms, it helps people know where to invest, uh, what to invest in, how to invest, who to invest with, etc. And we were in Australia, and it was it was a, a you know I was there. That's when I met Henny Besaidnote and his business partner Peter Fenstra, and they were very very wealthy guys. It had taken them more than a decade to to leave the country they lived in and actually go overseas and be able to invest in a first world country being Australia. And then, you know, they'd been going to Australia for more than four years until they could actually do something. So it's interesting. They had the knowledge and they had plenty of money and they still didn't know what to do. And they finally got started and, and they got started in medical buildings, which is what Henny's history had been since 1992, which was already, you know, 20 odd years uh, plus. And um, I'll never forget, it was right in the middle of the, the global financial crisis and I said to him, why medical buildings? You know, I've helped two and a half thousand people invest in housing apartments. You know, why, why medical buildings? He said, Scott, no matter what happens in the world, people will always need doctors. I'm like, yep, okay, fair point. Secondly, <laughs> doctors never leave their premises. Like it takes a lot to kind of put their, their, their machines and everything in and they never leave. And I thought back and I thought, you know, ever since I was a kid, like the, the doctor's rooms that I used to go to, like they've never changed. I mean, in my case, unfortunately, the doctors died, but but the, but the doctors' rooms are still there. You know, the medical right, premises. Right. And the third thing is the doctors are incredible at what they do in looking after people, but they're not as you know as economically sound as as an accountant from J.P. Morgan, and so they don't negotiate as hard as as a as you know a bank, and um, and so you tend to get a, a, a tenant that is, you know, very stable no matter what the economic conditions are. They never leave and they sign favorable rents. And I was like, that is an absolute no-brainer. Like, why did no one teach me that at school or university? Like, why did no one taught me that? Um, and I literally turned around to them and I said, right, I'm in. Like, how much money do I need to invest to, to partner with you guys? And they said, five million Australian dollars. Wow. And I was, okay, now we've got a problem. Um, <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I carry your bags? And um, anyway, so the the rest is history because I, I you know I spent probably four, well like I explained already four years working with them building the platform and then launching the platform and so you're 100 percent right it is very complex to invest overseas uh, real estate is hard enough in your own town let alone in a in a foreign town and yet with a huge amount of experience with their tremendous track record uh, billions do billions of dollars actually invested in you know England, Australia, America specifically, we already had both the track record, the experience and the partnerships in place. And so once we built the platform on top of that, we really took some of the old age uh, methodologies, which, which you know, I tend to believe no matter what happens in business, no matter how technology changes things, the fundamentals remain the same. And those same fundamentals of investing remain in place what we've done with technology is enhance it. And whenever technology comes to a space, it does three things. So, you know, if Uber comes to taxis or Airbnb comes to hotels or Apple comes to music, it really only does three things. It mm -hmm. cuts the cost, it dramatically cuts out the middleman, and it increases the trust, the transparency, and the accessibility. And really, in, in our situation, we've done the same thing. So, you know, the traditional fundamentals of real estate investing are the same. However, we've cut the cost dramatically, we've cut out the middlemen, and we've increased the trust, the transparency. And the part that I like is that the minimum investment is $1,000, and therefore we've greatly enhanced and increased the accessibility. You no longer need $5 million to invest in the same deals you can invest with $1,000. Okay, so now you're, you're touching on stuff that's beginning to hit home you know, for myself and, and, and many of our listeners personally, uh, because I... 
have said for a while that, you know, the old ways of doing things with real estate, they're, they're, while they're, they're effective because there's so much value attached to transacting real estate, but the, it's time for them to change. It's time to move technology in to side of our, inside of our businesses and real estate practices simply because of all the things you just mentioned uh specifically the, the definitely the cutting costs but also the accessibility and one of the things that i specifically love um the with when it comes to you know you mentioned the, the platform airbnb they're they're a marketplace like like any other what the the thing that i love about things like that is the entry point, which it was previously a roadblock, is now level playing field. And that's what you guys are doing when it comes to bigger uh, apartments. So talk to us um, a little bit about some of the the, the variety and styles and, and types, uh, not only the types of investments, but the investment objectives, because I'm assuming not everything is, you know, has the same purpose. I'm assuming some are growth, some are income, some are tax preferential, you know, types of things. But talk to us about some of the different ways that people have actually leveraged the platform that now that they have this increased access, what are they doing with it? So, look, I think I think it's a great question. And, you know, for me, something that I'm very passionate about is, is you've already mentioned it, but supporting the 99%, empowering them and giving them access to the same opportunities that the top 1% are investing in. So we don't, it's not a spray and pray approach. I tend to say to people that, you know, there's, there's two types of marketplaces. You've got a flea market, which uh, there's a lot of variety and a lot of selection. And some of the stuff you can buy there is, is great and some of it is terrible. And then you've got something like Fifth Avenue Saks or Harrods in London. And there, you know, there's not as much selection, but it's about quality and safety. So the first proviso that we decided upon was that we would have less selection and more quality and safety. Got so that's the, that's the first thing for us that's really important. We believe that, you know, it's, it's, it's more important that we uh, preserve people's capital and, and make sure that we've put in, in place all the safety mechanisms and the due diligence and everything else than to try and shoot the lights out. You know, there's a great saying, most people t try and work uh, on, on return, return uh, on capital. Mm -hmm. You know, we tend to say the most important thing is actually return off capital, and then we worry about return on capital. And um, so it's just a bit of a play on words. But my point being is that once we've, once we've uh, solved that problem, then our next major component is that we, you know, we the, the whole Git system is a ten-layer system. So we, you know, we focus on which country, which city, but ultimately we get down to what you said, which is really just two buckets that we put our opportunities into. The one are income buckets, okay. which are existing properties with existing rent rolls, where people can, you know, they invest. It's a tangible building; you can touch it, see it. And it earns a rental income. So, and those those um, those rental incomes are paid uh, quarterly. Got it. Generally, we we take a five year view on a property, and we or and we actually buy it and we hold it for at least five years. And people can you know obviously invest and earn the income plus the capital growth, and then they can either exit you know after five years. And and the nice thing is now with this with the secondary market, they can actually look at uh, having liquidity even within the five years. The second bucket is what we call the growth, and that tends to be new developments. So that might be a project where we've got a piece of land, we're going to redevelop it, build 50 you know, uh, residential apartments or condos, as you call them in, uh, <laughs> in America, <laughs> and then you know, on, on sell them and, and ultimately make a development profit. And you know, the, the entire return is made on the back end. And you know, in simple terms, those are the two you know, major buckets that we have. With time, we've been creating other products. You, you spoke about um, a tax and uh, some, some tax products, and, and it depends on the countries, but there's you know, different tax vehicles that people participate in. And there's another one that's really important for a lot of people, you know, when, particularly when they live in emerging markets like Africa or India or China, and that's that they want to invest in the first world and they want to get a passport. So you know, in America, oh. we've, got a, we've got a package there which is called EB-5 where yeah. people can invest real estate and get a green card and um, you know those type of products are also very popular because it achieves two purposes 
Now, uh, speaking of which, because you you actually just hit on something that is now interest of interest to me personally. Uh, do you have it the the other way? Like if uh, if I if a, an American citizen wanted a a second passport from another country, do you, do you have stuff in those other you know one of the other G twenties to be able to do the same thing? It's quite an interesting question, actually. So so we uh, we don't. And um, the reason being is that Australia's barrier to entry is just, uh, we find just too high. So it's uh, 5 million Australian dollars. And um, the England and, and, and ultimately now what's happened with Brexit is a bit up in the air <laughs> as to what you actually get between a Good British point. passport and a European passport. So, you know, we've tended to focus on those three primary markets because the number one thing that we help people do is invest in, in first class, you know, first world quality commercial assets. And we believe that turns you into a, a global citizen, which ultimately allows you to live anywhere you want in the world. Um, you know, so for me, Jay, the, 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 what I would say to you is that, you know, if you own in, in the first world assets, you know, in, uh, in Orange County where you are and it's paying you a good passive income, you can live anywhere you want in the world. I mean, you can come to South Africa and live in South Africa if you want to, um, because you're not necessarily trying to work in South Africa. Um, on a holiday visa. So I, I'd, I'd almost turn the question around on you and say, I don't think you need to buy assets to be able to get a passport. There's plenty of countries you can do it in Cyprus, Malta, Mauritius. In fact, my book, I wrote about 16 different countries. But my, my, uh, I don't want to use the word advice, but what I would, uh, what I would uh, recommend you to do is, is ultimately focus on being a global citizen. And once you've, and I know this is the very show that, that I'm supposed to talk about this on is that once you've built out the, you know global cash flow, you can live anywhere and do anything you want, you know, and that that really should be the primary focus. Indeed, indeed, and and I'm no disagreement, Scott. But here's where I'm coming from. In my time in business, um, one thing that I have learned to avoid, and I learned the very, very, very hard way, was uh, single points of failure, and. A point of failure for most people listening, and one of the things that I think you guys actually bring to the table quite well is a diversification between economies. You know, if all of my assets are tied to any one economy, something happens to that economy, as to your point earlier, when, you know, the U.S. economy was, uh, real estate specifically, was in the tank in, in 08, 09, uh, Australia was doing something completely different. Well, I might want to have some diversification beyond that. And that's what I'm sitting here thinking about is like, hey, uh, what if while the U.S. goes down or, uh, you know, Europe goes down and I want to take a, a holiday for a few years in Australia where things are fun for a while? Um, and I just see that as something that you guys could easily bring uh, to the table for a certain type of customer who I know is out there. Yeah, look, it's a great it's a great uh you know, I, I, we certainly don't know everything, and we've always got our ears open. So we don't offer it at the moment, but it's definitely something we should look into. And um, you're 100% right about the diversity side. Um, you know, I feel very, very strongly that no one place is the right place. You know, if you had all your money, you know, tied up in commercial properties in Christchurch when the earthquake happened, you're not looking so clever, you know, and all, all your money in America. You know, it's, uh, you know it's, it's, if you had all your money in England when Brexit, you know, caused the market to, to right. the commercial market. 20%. So, you know, the, the, the challenge is, is that even five years ago, to be diversified, particularly in real estate across different countries and different asset classes, literally was um, not only for the top 1%, but almost for the top one of the top 1%. You know, literally, right. you needed to have tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to be able to do it. And I think what we've offered, you know, through technology is allowing you that diversification so that you can diversify across economies, currencies, asset classes, and currencies. And um, yeah, so maybe we need to add passports onto that uh, to to help you out. <laughs> Just something to to think about. I think. I mean, the the diversification. If you're gonna have you know minimums as low as a thousand dollars, I think there's a lot of people who would want to enjoy something of that nature obviously they that person would already have more than a thousand dollars but you get what well, you get my point is what i'm saying so with all of the things that you guys have been been well, able to I, sorry, well, sorry, just before we go to the next question i just want to answer something for you yeah. one of the um projects that we just uh just closed actually was a group called entrepreneurial resorts the founders based out of bali um he's a cambridge you know he studied at cambridge but now lives in bali and he's actually launched an entrepreneur resort. So it's uh, 
a resort in Bali. It's a big five game reserve in uh, South Africa. Um, I know they're looking to do stuff in Hawaii. And ultimately, they are these work hubs where entrepreneurs can go around the world and both live and work and play and meet other entrepreneurs. And basically, it's the entrepreneur resorts and the um, beach resorts. And um, really, it actually ties in with what you're just saying in terms of, you know, continuing to live the lifestyle but experience the world. Well, and, and that's the thing is that the entrepreneurs today, myself included, one of the things I, I like is that if I decide to move, you know, locations, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> it just doesn't matter. All I got, I got to make sure I have Wi-Fi because that matters and, and my uh, computer equipment and, and whatnot. So long as I've got that, I'm, I'm in business. I can actually operate and you're making this so much more, ex, you know, accessible for everyone, as you mentioned. Uh, but it can become a lifestyle choice to bounce between country to country and without it necessarily affecting uh, you know, your income in any way, shape or form. And, and you're just making this even, even more accessible to so many people. Yeah, look, I mean, from my perspective, I did nine years in London. I then did uh, a number of years in a city called Johannesburg, the big financial capital of Africa. And uh, in simple terms, I actually read Tim Ferriss's book, uh, The 4-Hour Work Week. <laughs> yes. in and I was like, I spent my whole life trying to build a tech company. Why am I living in, you know, the equivalent of like the New York, if you want to call it that, you know, where, where it's kind of financial capital, but not, not, in my opinion, not a much lifestyle in terms of that outdoor lifestyle. And um, I moved to the beach and um, ironically, my business went up, my cash flow went up, uh, my businesses did better and, uh, and the rest is history. You know, I now live in a little, a little holiday town that's got literally 5,000 people and um, it's, it's the number one holiday town in the country. And I mean, I'm not saying that to boast. I'm actually just saying that because it's possible for people. You know, I, I mean, we run a we run a global company that's on five continents. So I, I truly, I right. truly endorse what you're saying. Exactly, exactly. So l let me ask this: There's a number of entrepreneurs and would-be entrepreneurs who are listening right now who probably, you know, want to know that that super secret sauce to making their version of your lifestyle happen. So if I was to ask you the following question: What are the top three mistakes that you feel that you've made that you would hope someone wouldn't make <laughs> that you've learned the most from what, what are they and what did you learn? So the first mistake I would say off the top of my head is that as entrepreneurs, we read the books and we think that we've got to be able to do it all. So I read a book called E-Myth. Most entrepreneurs would have read it, mm -hmm. and it's all about kind of how do we systemize and basically create the next McDonald's. And every single year, I used to, you know, write down my goals and it'd be this year I'm going to systemize. And every <laughs> every year, I'd get to the end of the year and I'd berate myself because I hadn't systemized. And um, what happened to me was I met a guy called Roger Hamilton, mm. and yes. he's, he's got a great system called Wealth uh, Dynamics that I would highly recommend people check out. And um, he literally, you know, taught me that that you know, all of all the different parts of the business are important. And he showed me what I'm good at and let me be in my flow and find the people that love what they do. You know, tonight before I came on the show, I've got my board meeting on Saturday and I was looking through my financials and, you know, quite frankly, I'd rather, you know, put two chopsticks through my eyes. You know, it's, it's really not what I enjoy doing. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's people that wake up in the morning and like that's what they get truly excited about, you know, like right. going and building a spreadsheet. And um, I think my point being is that, so my first mistake was taking 10 years to learn that. And now that we've really got some great people on board, you know, and they, they do what they love and I do what I love, it's really enabled uh, all of us. We've got an incredible team now uh, to be able to go to the next level. And, and you cannot do everything. You have to play to your strengths and find people that play to theirs. Yeah, totally understood. So That's that one. Be number one. Number one. Uh, number two for me would be, you know, really, I've, um, I've made mistakes in the past. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people in terms of choosing business partners and, uh, and, and the people who join your team. So two parts to that. One is that you, you tend to often, you know, get close together with uh, friends or family and people that you, you know, you know and like. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're good for them or they're good for you. And, and often you, you really struggle to, to have the difficult conversations. So, you know, it's a bit like when you get married. My wife's a lawyer, and when I, you know, six days before I got married, I nearly got divorced because I tried to talk about the anti-nuptial contract. And, uh, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, 
most of us in business are exactly the same. You know, only we only ever worry about how we're going to split up our our wonderful fortune after the IPO or whatever. But we don't talk about the hard things like who's going to be the leader, right? And who's going to make the final decision? And you know what's going to happen when the shit hits the fan? Sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but <laughs> and, <laughs> but, uh, but I like the fact that you didn't go if it's a win, and that's yeah. really important to yeah. understand. Yes, and I think so. So you know, it's having those difficult conversations and and really choosing. You know the, the the you know well basically being prepared to have the difficult conversations and trying to choose the right people, and then the third one for me would would probably be in line, and you can probably hear you know the 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 thread here. But for many years, I gave myself the excuses I couldn't afford it. Mm. I couldn't afford to have a secretary or PA because I didn't have the money. I couldn't afford to get that person because I didn't have the money. I always used um, constraints as excuses, but primarily when it came to people and not hiring the very best people, literally, that you can get globally to join your team. And that changed for me in 2013. I got an incredible business partner on board and um, a gentleman by the name of Yaku, and he just unlocked everything. Like, he literally uh, built more systems in six months than I'd built in 10 years. Uh, it unlocked our one business. Because of that, it, it provided us with the cash flow to, to really you know, start investing in wealth migrate and really today, you know, we have Wealth Migrate because of the incredible people that have joined the team, far, far smarter and better than I am. And, and that really unlocked the opportunity. And um, I believe it's been, you know, fundamentally better for them as well. So it's been win-win. So those have been my three mistakes that have held me back and, and you know, that I would love people to not make themselves. <laughs> totally understood. Now, let me ask this question, though. Even though you had to go through the mistakes, um, how do you feel about the process in in and of itself? Does is is there value in going through it, or if you could skip it, skip it? My father taught me what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> so uh, I think I was brought up in a very kind of traditional household where, you know, um, again challenges are challenges are a good thing. You know, in the same way, a competitive household where you know I was taught that. Uh, no one remembers who comes second. And I think my point being right. is that one of the greatest skills that an entrepreneur needs to learn, and quite frankly, if they don't have it, it's the one skill that I would recommend that you really review if you truly want to be an entrepreneur, is persistence. Because you use the word, it's not a case of if, it's a case of when. Uh, you will have challenges. Um, I read a great book a couple of weeks ago where they spoke about how, you know, it's not a case of if the business is going to have that moment when literally it, it you know it's either going to die or survive, it's a case of when and 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 quite frankly how often, <laughs> and uh, right. you know so to come back to your thing is it is it good it's it's essential and it's going to happen whether you like it or not, and um, you know I might have made those mistakes and I might have managed to avoid a few others and other people might avoid the mistakes I've made and and make a few others but but I guarantee you're going to make mistakes I don't care how many. MBAs you've got and or degrees and or mentors, uh, you're going to make significant mistakes. And, you know, what I always say to my friends, no one ever learned to swim by reading a book. Um, at the end of the day, you've got to jump in the pool. Agreed 100%. So for those that have listened this far and uh, that they, they like the, the philosophy you laid down and maybe they want to find out more about what you guys got going on, what's going to be the best way for them to catch up with you? So the best way, you know, from a website and platform perspective is, is literally just go to wealthmigrate.com, uh, you know, go and check it out, you know, really uh, sign up. We've actually got a, a condo that we are giving away uh, in the tallest building in Cape Town, which has been for seven years in a row by TripAdvisor, the number one holiday destination in the world. So, and all you've got to do is, is sign up on the platform to go in that draw. And people say, why are we doing it? Uh, for the exact same reason that Uber gave away free vouchers. Because <laughs> once you've tested it, you might realize that technology is changing the space and that there's a better way to do it. Um, and if you want to find me personally, you know, um, without being arrogant, just Google <laughs> Scott Picken. Um, but I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd happily reach out and, and help people and give them guidance. I'd also, you know, if, if they want to get a copy of my book, propertygoingglobal.com, uh, Literally, just go online. Um, you can actually sign up and uh, and register, and you can get a copy of it. And um, you know, it, it tells you a little bit about about my story. And the last thing, you know, Jay, is that if people do want to go on the platform, we've we've got a couple of white papers there that are at different levels. So for the beginner that wants to create wealth in real estate, 
for the intermediate that now wants to go international and you know and start investing outside the country that they that they used to and then finally for the sophisticated that wants to build a global portfolio so happy to share those you know if people want to go along to the platform uh, wealthmigrate.com and we can we can help them out but most importantly i uh, i just want to share with people so that they've got the the knowledge and they feel empowered to be able to make their own decisions and ultimately live a life of greatness totally understood i just want to make sure i heard that correctly you're giving away a condo we're giving away a condo that's exactly right perfect so because uh, i know someone was listening going did he just say that yeah he said yeah, that. one of my university friends one of my you know you need your great friends from university to call it and uh he said what's the catch and i said there is no catch you know why did uber why did uber give away you know the free the free vouchers and whatever and the logic is we we actually just enticing people to go and try it out and actually you know at a philanthropic level uh we actually started the competition on the 27th of april which most people don't know but it was the first day of the free and fair elections of nelson mandela in 1994 and it's it's called freedom day here in south africa and that was all about political freedom for the first time for everyone and I feel very strongly about economic freedom for everyone. And so our purpose as a company is to empower the 99% and ultimately go a long way to solving the wealth gap. And the condo was really a symbol and metaphor for that. Got it. Totally understood. Totally understood. So as we end here, um, what I want to do is I want to ask you one final question because I, I think your answer is going to be interesting and helpful for a number of people. So let's pretend for a moment, you know, Scott, that that someone listening has they've been bitten by that bug, so to speak, or another way of saying it is that they think they're going to throw their hat in the ring. They're going to become that entrepreneur. They're standing on uh, on the edge. They could even be in front of what I like to call the superhero outfit store, ready to pick out their cape and tights because they're going to go do this thing. But as you and I both know, when we come to those moments of great decision, there's often a companion that travels with us consistently. And for many of us, that companion comes in the form of a voice, a voice that tends to remind us what we can't do, how it won't work, and oh my God, don't you remember the last time you had a great idea? And for some people, they're actually related to that voice. So my question to you is as follows. Let's pretend that the person listening is actually going to follow through. They're going to do what you suggest, and they're going to do so in the next 24 to 48 hours. My question to you is simple. What would you suggest that they do? My uncle taught me at a young age that the best way to manage risk is work out what your worst case scenario is. And if you can manage that, then everything else is upside. So, you know, my story, I was 26 years old. Uh, please understand that I understand what the other side of the equation looks like. I wasn't given a, a, a silver spoon. I, you know, my father at the age of 17 um, unfortunately got cancer and at the age of 26, he had, he had passed away. And so I put myself through university. I, I, everything I did on the real estate side, I did it with my own money, uh, and, and, and getting started. And, you know, my point being is that my uncle taught me about the whole risk component. And so when I was 25 years old, I had a very good job in, in, in London. I was a group IT manager of a hundred million pound uh, development firm. And really it was an absolute no brainer where my career was going. But I looked at it and I went, I always wanted to work for myself. I always wanted to build my own company. I'm 26 years old. What's the worst case scenario? I literally, um, you know, I could go bankrupt and all I got to do is end up on the couch with my mates. And really there's no downside. I got no wife, no children, no risk. And, um, and, you know, for me, really, it was just a case of, 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 of uh, looking at that. And then, you know, once you've understood what your worst case scenario is, then you start worrying about what your upside is and, and really just focusing on the upside. And, um, you know, so for me, the, the advice that I would give to people is, is work out what your worst case scenario is and then go with it. It's one of the reasons that we, you know, even in terms of what we do, that's why we got our minimums down to $1,000 so that people can literally dip their toe. And then the second thing that I would say to people is have the commitment. The most successful people that I've met in the world are people that have a plan, have a commitment and stay the course. And that's why I spoke about the rule of 10,000 hours. If you want to be great at something, understand that you're not going to be an Olympic swimmer the first time you jump in the pool. <laughs> and so, you know, have, a, have the commitment to stay the course and, and learn. And uh, that's why, you know, we don't sell you any courses or coaching. Uh, we like to help people invest and learn while doing. Totally understood. 
I got it. I like it a lot. I like everything uh, that that you've shared here. I like the again. You you know I like the diversification amongst the economies, etc. That you guys are bringing to the table. But most importantly, I, I appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge, your wisdom, as well as your insight here with us today at the Cash Flow Diary, sir. Awesome. Well, Jay, thanks for your time and thanks to all your listeners. And most importantly, guys, go out there. You know, I learned something, you know, at a young age, you know, your destiny is ultimately determined by the decisions you make and the actions you take. So go live a life of greatness, but make sure that you take the decisions and the actions to make it happen. Thanks, sir. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean? That means get over to wealthmigrate.com. Why? Because you know opportunities are sitting there. I know some of you have thought about it. You're like, man, I live all the way over here. How on earth can I get to to investments in, in other countries? Well, now you have a way to make it happen. At the end of the day, guys, technology, internet, entrepreneurs, we're all coming together to make more, greater opportunities happen and you've just heard about another one. Now it's up to you to do something about it. It's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.